I hope y'all found that as inspiring as I did when I saw that. I watched it like ten times. And it goes pretty fast, but that's because all the names of Jesus are not even in there. Uh, today we're continuing in our discipleship series, Unit 2, Jesus Christ, Who is This Man? And so far we've learned that Jesus has a sinful nature, but never gives into it. That He's fully man and fully God. The Father and Son are the same in essence, but different in person. And then last week, Phil spoke on who did he think he was. So today, I'll be speaking on Jesus is worthy of worship. So let's look at the word. In Hebrews 1, God tells us that Jesus is worthy of worship. That's good enough for me. There's many reasons why Jesus is worthy of worship. But first and foremost, God says it. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times and in many different ways. But now in these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. God has chosen His Son to own all things, and through Him He made the world. Verse 3, The Son reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like. He holds everything together with His powerful Word. When the Son made people clean from their sins, He sat down at the right side of God, the Great One in Heaven. And that was from the New Century Version. I had not read from that before, but I really thought that um, was the way it worded it was really terrific. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on verse 3 because that one verse tells us five very powerful things about Jesus. And it gives us more reasons to worship Him. So the first part, the sun reflects the glory of God and shows us exactly what He's like. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that Jesus has all the glory of God dwelling in Him. In the Old Testament, God would sometimes come down into the tabernacle or into the temple, and it was said that the Shekinah or the Shekinah glory of God had rested on the place. And it just describes the presence of God in a location. Even though God can't be contained, it was His presence in a location. And often that would be the dark cloud that we learned about in Bible study that would appear over the temple once it got stationary. But the Bible says that that's what Jesus was. It was God's presence here on earth. The very Shekinah or Shekinah glory of God came down and lived among us. In the second part of verse 3, it, show, it says that Jesus shows exactly what God is like. In the New King James words, it, the Son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. So every last little detail of the character of Jesus is like God. The third part that we learn, the third reason in verse 3, it goes on to say that Jesus upholds everything by the word of His power. All of creation is held together by His power. One of those powers is gravity. That's how our solar system is suspended in the universe and held together. And Jesus created that. And we know gravity on this earth. I know when I was a kid, I was a real tomboy. I tested gravity all the time. But you can't beat gravity. It's just a law. And Jesus upholds that by His very existence. So as Christians, we know that Jesus created signs. We have scientists that are learning new things all the time. And they learn, sometimes they say the universe is growing. Sometimes it's not. They say Big Bang Theory. But we know Whatever the science is, Jesus is the reason for the reasons. He's behind it. That's our God. In the fourth part, it says, The very one whose word keeps the word in motion came down and cleaned people from their sins. 
that's pretty awesome that the creator of everything that we see came down to this earth to pay the death penalty for our sins. That just gives me chills when I think about it. That in itself is worthy of us loving Him so much and worshiping Him. You know, He created us, and when He created us, He knew that we would sin, and He made provision from the foundation of the world. He told us not to eat the fruit, and we did. And He could have just left us alone and led us to our own devices, but that's not why He created it created us. It was because He loved us so much. That's our Jesus. And the fifth part, which is the conclusion of it, Jesus returned to the right hand of the Father, where He is currently waiting for His triumphal return to earth. So, these five reasons in these, this one verse tells us Jesus contains the very glory of God. Jesus is the very fingerprint of God. Jesus is the power behind all the laws of nature. Jesus is the one who came and saved us from our sins. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, awaiting His return to earth. So that one verse is so powerful. It tells us a lot about Jesus. God used Jesus to speak to us that He owns all things, made all things, and He reflects God's glory. And He shows us exactly what God is like. If we continue on to verse 8, but God said this about His Son, God, Your throne will last forever and ever. And again in verse 10, God also says, Lord, in the beginning You made the earth and your hands made the skies. But you never change, and your life will never end. And Revelation says that God and Jesus are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same in essence, but different in person. My mind has a hard time understanding that, but I believe it with all my heart because God says it and I embrace it. Jesus is God the King. He sits on His throne. He's exalted above all creation. He's clothed with majesty. He's sovereign over every square inch of creation and every second of time. That means He's in perfect control 100% of the time. We as humans, we get anxious, we worry, we scheme, we devise, we plan, we do all these things, but Jesus is in control. And I'm not sure about you, but as I mature as a Christian, I'm learning to get my claws off of things and let Jesus have control because He can do a much better taking care of things than I can. That's our Jesus. He never changes. We can count on change in life constantly, but Jesus will be there for us tomorrow and the day after that, and He'll be with us every day of our lives to our last breath. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. We can trust Him in every circumstance, every disappointment, every heartache. We can trust Him with every nook and cranny of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that we have in life. We have a lot of that in this world today. When all seems lost, He is sovereign. When evil seems to have the upper hand, He is good. When change sends our minds racing, He is unchanging. How can we not submit to His reign in our lives? We should worship Him because He is worthy of worship. Another reason he's, one of the many reasons he's worthy of worship is because he is the resurrection and the life, the only way of salvation. He said this, that whoever believes in him, though he dies, yet he shall live, and everyone who lives and believes in him shall never die. And he tells us this in John 11, when Lazarus is sick, and Martha and Mary 
you know, tell Jesus that he's sick. And as I was studying this, I remembered that Mary, the sisters, Mary, uh, she was the same one that went to the supper and had the expensive ointment oils that anointed Jesus' feet and used her tears to wash his feet and used her hair to dry his feet. That's the same Mary. So they tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick and they expect him to go right away to, to him because they believe that he's going to die. And Jesus even talks to her about it, but she believes that, well, yes, he's going to die, but he'll be raised at the last day. But Jesus was telling her, no, that he will live. Jesus has got a plan here that they don't understand. So he delays going to Lazarus. So by the time he gets there, he's been in the grave for four days. And so he raises him from the dead. And he does this because he brought glory to God. And it also showed who he was. He had power over death. <coughs> Jesus is worthy of our worship because everything he has ever done is because he loves us so much. When he made us, he knew we would sin. But I would like to think that he wasn't asked before the foundation of the world to sacrifice himself. It was He just was going to do it. It was just accepted as it was. That's how much he loved us. And he still wanted to create us. When I was growing up, we, did, we weren't really taught about Jesus' love for us. I remember the little, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But in my memory, and I'm sure I, it's not that great, but I don't remember being taught that Jesus really loves me. He wants to know me. It was just, Jesus loves us, He died for us, and that was that. I just couldn't make it work in here. It didn't, the mind and the heart didn't meet on it. But since then, I've learned that Jesus has planned each one of us. He created us. He created me. He wanted a Diane with certain personality and traits. And he doesn't approve of all the things that I do that are not right, but he still wanted them. He wanted each of us, each of you too. But he planned us. He wanted us. That's, that's desire. That's love. He didn't create us to point fingers at us that we're not doing right all the time. And that's pretty much what I learned growing up about God, that he was constantly watching us and we were messing up and it was bad we were going to go to hell and that's just not what God wants us to think about he wants us to know that he is for us he has a plan for us he gives us ideas in when people have inventions or people write books and they write songs where do you think that comes from it all comes from God he wants us to be creative and He made billions of us, and there's more to come. And He made us because He wanted us. If I can stress anything, it's how much Jesus loves us and wants us. He sees us as successful. He's not there but bopping us on the back of the head when we mess up. When we mess up, He's working out how He's going to use that for our better. That's our Jesus. And He intercedes before us in the throne of heaven. Remember Job, how Satan was accusing him, went to God and was, Job, he'll curse you to your face if you do this and that. Well, Satan might as well forget it because God sees us clean because of Jesus. So accusing us does absolutely no good. You know, Jesus shows us such compassion. There's many of us that are hurting, the, the deprived, the neglected, the rejected, the downcast. Those that society rejects, God loves. He gives us the Holy Spirit to teach us. If we'll submit to the Holy Spirit, we don't have to worry and fret about things. Jesus will take care of it for us. There's nothing too small that we can ask Jesus for. And He knows what we need before we ask. So when should we worship Jesus? That's easy. We should worship Him all the time. And it's easy to worship Jesus in the good times, the things that He does for you. 
I was going to Walmart yesterday, just a small example, and I knew it was going to be terribly busy, and I don't like going there. And so I asked the Holy Spirit, I would really like to have a parking spot if it's not too much trouble. And I didn't get the words out of my mouth, and there was a spot right there, close to the front. That was Jesus being so good to me. And Jesus doesn't answer our prayers like that every time, but I just believe those moments are little moments of encouragement, that just a reassurance that He's with us, even though He's with us in the bad times too. And so we should worship Jesus in our darkest moments. And I thought I would share my darkest moment, which was on September the 27th in 2008. It was the culmination of a year-long struggle that my husband had, his mental decline. He became quite mean, had terrible language. And I woke up one morning with him standing over my bed and it was a two-week siege on my person. He took my car keys, took checkbooks, credit cards, I had no place to go. And he started berating me for two whole weeks, accusing me of all sorts of terrible, terrible things that I was not guilty of. And it was such a shock to me. And I was ashamed. I couldn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell my best friend. I didn't tell my minister till the very end because I didn't want him to come into such an ugly, ugly circumstance. But on that day, on the 27th, I got up that morning and I decided I'd had enough. I couldn't take it anymore. I'd eaten like two meals in like a week. I was just, it was a terrible time. But at the same time, I'd been praying a lot and I'd been making it through it. And when I thought it got its worst, a little peace kind of started coming to me because I was trusting Jesus. I knew He knew what I was going through. And I just kind of felt like it was, I'd get little glimpses of hope. But then my husband would start verbally abusing me again, and I'd kind of lose that. But on the 27th, I woke up with him standing over my bed. He said he wanted to talk to me, and I said, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I said, it, it's not true. None of this is true. He goes, I want to talk to you about something else. So I'm trying to make a long story short. Went in had two sofas that faced each other and we sat down and when his butt hit the cushion he started talking the same old trash talk, the foulest language you've ever heard. And I stood up and said, I'm just not going to take it anymore. Well, he comes across the room at me and pins me down on the sofa and it doesn't feel good. And so somehow I fling him off and we wind up in the kitchen. He's got me backed up against the cabinet. He's got his hands around my throat choking me shaking me and he goes I'm going to kill you and that's when this perfect waterfall of warmth just falls over me because I knew Jesus was with me at that exact moment and when someone's choking you you put your hand it's natural for you to fight and so I just dropped my hands and I said go ahead anything's better than this and anyway, he backed off. That backed him off. But I was able to escape that day. He finally gave me my car keys back. And I fled to, you know, Mississippi. And it was very hard because he died three months later from a stroke. So I never saw him again. It was almost to the day when I left when he died of a stroke. But I didn't realize until... I was doing this message that I worship Jesus. I knew Jesus was going to take care of me in that moment. I just knew it. And that was the start of my growth. More growth as Christian maturity. I had really tough times after that. I had moments where I'd have to get out of bed in the middle of the night and tell Satan to get away from me because he attacked me so viciously for so long about that. I felt terrible guilt over things I hadn't even done. But look at where God's brought me. You know, I tell you this story to encourage you because in your darkest moments, you can turn to Christ and He is there for you. You know, you hate to go through those things, but I look back on it. That story has inspired other people. There were women that talked to me about their husbands who had Parkinson's, who lost their minds and turned into just vicious people. 
And that encouraged them. And I think God wants us to share those moments with others because it does encourage them. They can identify with us. It's us showing God's love to others. That's what He wants us to do by sharing ourselves and our experiences because they make us who we are. And I just wanted to share that with y'all because I think it's important. But Jesus, I love my Jesus. And I am so thankful to be on Team Jesus. We're all a team. We love each other. We support each other. And let's take that to other people too. So should we worship Jesus? Absolutely. And we should follow His example no matter where we go. Do people see Jesus in us? I think about that when I go to Walmart. There's always someone at the end of the driveway they have a little sign that tells their troubles. That just speaks to my heart. I'm one that I want to be giving and not worry. And Jesus will do the rest. I give. He makes sure that that giving does good. But we need to be Jesus walking on this earth. And people should be able to look at us and see Jesus in us. We can talk, talk, talk all we want. But it's the doing that makes the difference. So I wanted to conclude with another little miracle that happened to me this week. God just is so good to me. But I was at Bible study. I've been having a hard time with my lesson this time or my message this time because I'm kind of OCD and ADD. I have a hard time focusing sometimes and I just... I had a hard time putting this message together and I worried, kind of fretted over it and I just felt like I was not doing my best for God and so I went to Bible study and my brother in Christ, I asked him to pray for me that I could complete my message and he told me, I won't pray that prayer but I will pray that God will give you peace. And so he prayed for me and I got home and it wasn't long after that. I just had this overwhelming sense of peace that the Holy Spirit blessed my message that I already had and I just needed to finish it up and then the rest of the week was just perfect so I hope in this message that we've learned that Jesus is worthy of worship, we're seasoned Christians I know we know that but we need to be reminded of it and I hope too that my experience and my trust in Jesus at my darkest hour. He saved me. And He'll save all of us. And He is saving us. Thank you.